It's high summer in Montana, and with a long drought continuing to bite, there is precious little to harvest. But for some ranchers here, their fields are proving much more fertile than they ever thought possible. And then you just keep following it up. And it probably came from up there because it's pretty warm. Larry Tuss is one farmer who's happy to look back in time. Coming out of the bank, right there. The seeds for his latest Gee. crop were planted millions of years ago. Now his field is producing <laughs> bones, dinosaur bones to be exact. Right here. This is a, that's a bone. Yeah. It's really an old weathered bone, but it's a bone. And you just look for... How do you know it's a bone rather than just a rock? Because it's got little... Um, you can see where the blood vessels were in the bone. Larry Tuss is a third generation wheat and barley farmer and now champion dinosaur hunter. Did you think though that you'd ever be that hooked on this? Never. Not, no, not in my wildest dreams. I never thought so. Uh, it's really, yeah, cool. What has captured your imagination about them? Uh, the diversity of them. So many different ones. There's, you know, it, like out of the 13 I've found, I've probably found seven different ones. Once he had discovered them, he realised his job was done. It was time to call in the professionals. The task of digging up his farm's prehistoric mother load has been handed over to a commercial fossil hunting company. And that's where Larry Tuss falls out with the scientific community. They have lots of land, but they have no money. And they, their, their crops are failing, they're not doing well, they're having trouble with their cattle. And so when they find fossils, used to be they would just kick them around and call them rocks, but now they find fossils and Instead of finding a scientist, they'll go through a broker or dealer and find someone to sell them to. And femurs of George Stanley is the head of the University of Montana's paleontology center. This is Teleosaurus, which is a very large and famous mammal from Montana. And this is part of the fossil heritage of our, of our state. He says valuable specimens are being destroyed as commercial fossil hunters dig for profit. These uh, uh, professional commercial collectors use bulldozers and backhoes and heavy equipment, even dynamite. And in the process of doing it, they're blasting away uh, potentially good fossils in the interest of getting one particular kind that they want. So they might run a bulldozer over, over some other fossils they consider not important. Yeah. Most dinosaur country is really pretty. <laughs> I love it. This is our office. Mike Trebold started professionally excavating prehistoric bones two decades ago. He and his team have been digging at this site in the Dog Creek Valley in America's Midwest for the past few weeks. He dismisses claims that outfits like his damage the nation's natural history. There are a few paleontologists who are just adamantly opposed to any sort of free enterprise when it comes to fossils. I do believe that the majority of paleontologists understand and appreciate what we're doing. Mike Trebold employs qualified paleontologists to assess the sites and help with the excavations. This is a bone map of all the shows the edge of the excavation. I have, or excuse me, the edge of the bone pile as it was exposed before we found it. And the excavation edge will be back here when we finish it. Paleontologist Craig Dursler from the University of New Orleans works for Trebold, no. helping to uncover and well, identify each bone right now, as can. they find it. Uh, super glue works just fine on, on he wet samples. He says there's no difference uh, to how he operates in the field on this commercial dig than what he'd be doing on a uh, university-funded excavation. Either way, it's a slow um, process. And we don't even know what this bone is yet, because we, until this gets removed you know, lifted off carefully and jacketed. We won't be able to expose this enough to figure out for sure what it is. 
but they had been able to confirm one thing for certain. It's a dinosaur. Because all dinosaurs have this non-bony hip socket. It's called, technical term is a perforated acetabulum. And birds and dinosaurs are the only two animal, two groups of animals that have this perforation. And that's one of the reasons why we say birds and dinosaurs are relatives closely related. This is a painstaking process. Dinosaurs emerge slowly after being scraped away bone by bone with brushes, picks and knives. Then each bone is given its own plaster cast to protect it. And the location where each bone was found is mapped out. Right now I've just got positions and, and numbers for each of the peripheral bones and I was just sketching in the main pile of bones, so I'm going to make a much larger version of this map so I can get all the detail into it. The hills around here are rich in dinosaur bones. This season alone, these fossil hunters have unearthed a mixed bag of prehistoric remains. In this particular summer, we've come up with at least four skeletons. We found parts of a horned dinosaur, but not enough to really count as a skeleton. And just uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, we found a tyrannosaurid skeleton. So as soon as we're finished with this, we'll go over and work on that. But before they can dig much deeper at this site, diagnostic help of the high-tech kind is called into play. This cast contains a potentially important discovery, unshelled or unbroken dinosaur eggs. The, the fun possibility that we have to consider is that they're um, potentially uh, unshelled eggs. Uh, they, they're kind of the right size, they have you know, little, lots of little bits of bone in them and I didn't want to expose the bone to see what it was. Craig and Larry have brought the dinosaur eggs to the local hospital in the hope that x-rays will tell them what is inside the shells. It's an after-hours operation, but not out of the ordinary for hospital staff who live in dinosaur country. And the first so round of x-rays fails to provide conclusive results. Well, uh, best case would have been that, yeah, sure, it is an egg, and yeah, well, we can see individual bones in there, or, or embryo bones, that were clear and distinct. Um, I was expecting something equivocal. Um, you know, like, yeah, maybe yes, maybe no, and that's kind of what we're seeing. But then the big guns of imaging are brought in. The hospital offers to put this fossil through its high-powered CAT scan. And the results give greater hope. There's... I don't... Oh, look at that. Um, there's some structure in there. I mean, whatever it is, this, this is going to give me a whole bunch more information to interpret it, but I, I really don't know without playing with the images a lot. And this is only one tooth, one single tooth. And um, it was collected by a young boy who brought it in with his mom. And but George Stanley says there are some things that scientists river. can't and condone. And buying and selling America's natural history is one of them. We are scientists, and we uh, think that fossils are priceless. We can't put a price on them. I've had people come to me and say, oh, uh, I, I have this fossil, I want you to appear in court and uh, testify to its value or write a statement. And I just refuse because I say, well, what is the value of a fossil? You can't put a monetary value on it. The value to me is the value to science. The United States Congress is currently considering legislation to restrict who has the right to collect fossils. Under federal law, America's lawmakers have restricted commercial fossil hunters to digging for bones on private land. Unless they're able to obtain a permit, which is being made harder to get. Pete Larson is a paleontologist and commercial fossil hunter who testified before Congress hoping to prevent new restrictions being imposed. They actually belong not to Americans, but to the world. They're part of our entire 
humanity's history, not just one country's history. It's, uh, how can we possibly e expect people to understand how evolution works if we don't have those objects which prove evolution a available to all the people who need to see those things? Museums are overwhelmingly the biggest buyers of fossils and dinosaur bones and in recent years have been bolstering their natural history displays. This is polyurethane foam. It's got a colouring agent in with it, actually the same thing we use with, uh, when you're colouring cement. But it's nice and light and very, very durable. It's the dinosaur nice, resurgence in museums it, it across the United States nicely. comes at a time when the fundamental theories of evolution have come under attack by creationists on the religious right. And we slide this on, making sure it's going to fit. And that's meant more work for commercial fossil companies to provide them with both real fossils and replicas. There's the cycad and its clone. Oops, we got to turn the clone around too. Clones a little easier to move. <laughs> Commercial fossil hunters argue that while exploration is the start point, this is the business end. Here we have a rib that's been like well, his commercial colleagues, Pete Larson and takes exception to academics complaining about buying and there, selling there and fossils kind of as them. they are his biggest clients. Commercial fossil hunters now uh, provide most of the exhibit specimens that you see in museums. Most of the new exhibits are, are creations of first, uh, commercial fossil people. And so it is, in essence, it's the, where most of the people see dinosaurs or see fossils. Those fossils were collected by people like, like ourselves. Pete Larson's team has been digging here in the Bear Lodge Mountains, a remote corner of northeast Wyoming, for the past eight years. 70-year-old Elaine and her husband Leslie have lived here all their lives. This property belonged to because Elaine's it was father. After my father passed away, then us kids split the place apart and we got it and we ran sheep for a while but the coyotes and whatnot got too bad. Now the wars are hoping dinosaur farming will be a lot more profitable. And I like thin, flat bones because that could possibly be a skull bone. And for that, they turn to commercial okay. fossil um, hunter this Pete is a, Larson. This bone that's coming out right here is very flat and very thin. He was like part of the part. team that discovered Sue, the Tyrannosaurus yeah. Rex. It became the world's most expensive dinosaur a Chicago museum, the new owner. Um, that fossil sold for $8.36 million. Uh, that was a revelation to us, but that is the far end of the spectrum. Um, most dinosaurs uh, will bring less than a million dollars, um, you know, that, uh, and, and there's so much work into it. Pete Larson's company leases the land for $1,000 a month, but the wars will also receive a percentage of all future sales of bones or of the replicas cast from the fossils discovered here. All of these little white pieces we see here, or most of them anyway, these are all bone. And um, so they're, you can see they're a little bit bleached in the sun, but that's a piece of dinosaur bone. But it's not individual bones they are seeking. The prize? Whole skeletons. And that is a long process, involving many thousands of working hours before they can see any return. That's the challenge, and in fact we've been digging here now for, this is our eighth year of really concentrated digging, and we have yet to uh, feel that we've collected enough material to put together even one of these skeletons yet, because we're, you know, we're missing, for instance, the, the, the arms of this uh, Camarasaurus that's up on top. Uh, in the end, we'll have probably five or six dinosaurs, but it may take us another five or ten years before we'll be able to put them together. But it is this site that makes academics and critics of commercial fossil hunters both nervous and angry. A wild storm the night before has drowned the dig site, and a decision is made to bring in heavy machinery to cut a drainage channel. Pete Larson defends this action, saying the years he spent in the field have taught him to take safe shortcuts. One very nice thing about uh, 
deposits like this is it follows the rule of geology and, and that is that we have basically horizons laid down at different times. So when we get into that yellow stuff, that's a limestone layer that, that actually marks the bottom of our bone deposit. When we're in that yellow stuff, there's no more bones. And so we can go through that rather wickedly uh, where we would not dare do that in the upper horizon. While capitalism is yet to match the dinosaur era's longevity, rancher Larry Tuss is hoping that his passion may eventually help fund his retirement. It would be, yeah. It, the dinosaurs probably won't sell for eight to ten years as a rule, and I'll be retiring in about eight to ten years. And so we're hoping that it'll be sort of a supplement income after we retire. That's sort of what we're hoping.